Okay, I'm walking through which the original entrance way to the Mott, through the inner ditch and into the Bailey area eventually. Go over here, I think, and get a good shot. You see that depression there now? That's probably the remains of a building. Here we are at Granard Motton Bailey Castle. In a, you know, just very briefly, uh, the castle was probably built in the 1190s. It had timber defences originally. It was built by an Anglo-Norman lord called Richard de Chute. Um, it represents, uh, if you like, the northwestern edge of Anglo-Norman settlement in the, of the Lordship of Meath. Now, in terms of what exactly is a Mott and Bailey, the Mott is actually the mound that we can see behind me. Uh, if you like, uh, the mound is probably about 10 metres in height. And then the bailey is this sort of banked and ditched enclosure uh, to the south of the Mott. So that's, what we're, that's the earthwork. And the bailey is defined by a ditch, an outer bank, and an outer ditch. This, this is a very complex earthwork. But again, the thing to remember is that the defences and buildings within it certainly for the first hundred years or so, were built of timber or cob. You're going to ask, what is cob? Cob was kind of mud-built structures. Um, but anyway, let's, 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 let's just talk a little bit into, about moths. In terms of numbers, mott castles, it'll surprise people to know that the vast majority, uh, when I say vast, the large majority of castles built by the Anglo-Normans in the late 12th, and 13th century were actually Mott and Bailey castles. They were with timber defences. Stone castles or masonry castles, the popular perception is of course that castles were built of stone. Only about 25% of the castles built by the Anglo-Normans were built of uh, masonry. The rest were uh, built of timber, mostly Mott or Mott and Bailey castles mounds and these encl attached enclosures, or were ringworks, which are circular banked and ditched enclosures. There aren't that many ringworks in Ireland. Um, in terms of numbers, we're talking about maybe 500 moths. Now that figure is questioned, but the work of the Archaeological Survey of Ireland, who are part of the National Monument Service, have gone through the Irish countryside uh, since uh, the uh, mid 80s and that's about the figure that they've come up with um, in terms of numbers, about 500 uh, moths. In terms of their distribution, you can find moths from Poland to Ireland, from Scandinavia down to northern, uh, northern Italy. But th the main distribution is northwest Europe, including eastern and midland uh, Ireland. Okay. In terms of County Longford, how many moths are there? Well, we've recognized about 13. Most of them have the Bailey feature like we have here at Granard. And it has been argued by various archeologists and historical geographers that the Bailey feature is both a feature of status, like how important the Lord, the Anglo-Norman Lord who built and owned the mot was uh, would have, you know, a, a castle belonging to a greater lord, a more important lord would have a bailey. But also it's been noticed that the bailey feature occurs on the frontier of Anglo-Norman settlement as well. And at Granard we have both. We have a high-ranking Anglo-Norman lord in the terms, in, 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 in terms of the de Chute or Richard de Chute and his family. And also we are in a frontier area here because the area to the the regions to the west and north of us uh, and northeast of us were dominated by Gaelic Irish princes and lords. And we do hear of, as we said in the historical section, we do hear of a lot of turbulence in the area. And I know um, 
some, you know, bringing some colleagues from across Europe to see this mott, uh, they, they, are, they are very impressed by the mott and Bailey Castle here at Granard. It's that much bigger than the average uh, mott. So what else can we say? We've talked about numbers, distribution. What about sighting? Well, what affected? Why, is the, why did Richard de Chute in the 1190s or so decide to build a mott on this spot? Well, when we look around us, we can see that it's in a very prominent position. Um, you can see literally for miles around, okay? Okay, we're now going to go to the summit of the mott and you'll see what I mean by that commanding view, okay? So here we are on the summit of the mott and you can see what sort of wide ranging views um, you can see all around us. We can see the Loch Crew Cairns, sorry, the Loch Crew Hills to our southeast. You can see Cavan and Bruce Hill to the northeast, sorry, to the, to the northeast. You can see um, the Quilcha Mountains on the Cavan Fermanagh Leitrim border to our north. Um, and you can also see Roscommon and Sleevebourne to the west. So it's fantastic. You literally see everywhere. You can just about make out Loch Derivar down there and, you, and Loch Canale uh, just to, to our east. So you really get fantastic views uh, right across the country. So at one level, this is a very impressive location. Literally, we're in a really fantastic position here, and that was obviously one of the reasons why Richard de Chute chose this location for his Mott Castle. But there's more to it than that, because when we look at the historical documents, we know that Granard was the centre of a pre-Norman Irish elite residence as well. And actually, when you look at the morphology of the Mott and Bailey, the bailey is crescentic in shape um, with the moth lying on its northern side. And it seems to me that what happened here, and we can see the same thing at a number of other uh, Longford moth and bailey castles, we seem to have a moth being placed on a pre-existing Irish ring fort. Okay, and then the ring fort is modified into a crescentic shaped a bailey. So, so we have both morphological, archaeological and historical evidence to, to realise that the Chute uh, placed his castle on top of um, a, a, a pre-existing centre, okay, a pre-existing fortification. And that's something to remember. The Anglo-Normans did not come into an empty landscape. They came into a landscape that had been settled, if you like, and farmed for millennia and, and very often took over pre-existing Irish centres. That's an, I think that's an important point. So that's the sighting. So we've talked then about distribution, how many moths there are, the fact that they're a type of castle we see right across Northern Europe in particular. Uh, we, um, we've talked about morphology. What else can we talk about? Well, we talk about function. What was the function of something like this? And in a way, we've hinted at it because we talked about the frontier nature of uh, settle Anglo-Norman settlement in this area. There was a lot of turbulence, uh, mainly from native Irish lords, upset, if you like, uh, at, at, at uh, the Anglo-Norman encroachment on their lands, but also often between the Anglo-Normans uh, themselves. So at one level, one, one function, if you like, of a castle is obviously to protect its inhabitants against attack. That's one function. But we also know that they're homes. And not only are they the homes of the elite, along with their servants and retainers, so people lived here and there would have been residential buildings of timber or cob in the bailey, or maybe even here on the Mott Summit, they were also centers of landed estates. So we have farm buildings in the vicinity. Um, so very often we find that in places like this, that land would have been farmed in the vicinity for profit. 
and not only would we have had residential buildings either within the bailey uh, in the bailey but we would also have had farm buildings maybe in the bailey but possibly somewhere uh, in the in the vicinity so we can define a castle then as the seriously defended residence of someone of lordly status uh, uh, the, the tenants of the lord would have come for judgment here and there probably would it was a courthouse either a separate building or a building within a larger wooden uh, structure so there's a lot going on here in terms of function then in terms of things like we talked a little bit about defense well what can we say about the defenses of a site like this well we do know when we look at the earthworks here i've already mentioned this is a very striking looking mott i'd say across europe the average size mott is five to six meters above uh, natural ground level the summit the flat summit that we're on now but here it's more it's somewhere between eight and ten meters so this is a big mott um, so and not only that the bailey with uh, it, it, its banks that, that define it and the two ditches and uh, intervening another inter second intervening bank these are very impressive earthworks and we know from excavation from pictorial evidence contemporary pictorial evidence uh, and also the historical sources that timber castles were not the poor relation if you like of the castle of castles but actually had quite serious defenses we have to imagine things like timber towers timber gatehouses um, crenellated timber palisades with arrow loops in them you know much of what we find on a great masonry a stone castle we would also find in timber here so the same defenses as i said arrow loops gatehouses but also here on the top of the mott around the edge of the mott you would have had a palisade i would think crenellated you know it had battlements but also arrow loops but maybe some great tower timber tower lying on the mott summit and some of those towers were anything up to three stories in height so you could imagine um, if we had a three-story high timber tower here on this very very significant mott you'd see it for miles and even now you can see uh, the Gr granard mott particularly to our south east and west for miles there was a feeling that mots only belong to the initial period of anglo-norman conquest in ireland that somehow they're they're linked to the first 10 20 years but this is actually not the case we have good historical and archaeological evidence for them continuing to be built into the early 13th century but also we now have archaeological and historical evidence for them being built as late as the late 13th century with Mots and Baileys continuing to uh, be occupied well into the 14th century. In other words, timber castles, Mott and Bailey castles, timber castles continue to be occupied and built well into the 13th century and then seem to um, stop being used at some stage in the 14th century okay so that's the kind of dating uh, phase now what else can we say let's talk about this particular mot well we mentioned that it's a really spectacular example of a mot of, of a mot castle in a, this mot and bailey at granard stands up to the best example right across europe and I might add, it's not the only uh, Longford Mott and Bailey that is top class in terms of preservation and size. size. Lizard Dowlin as well is a top rate Mott and Bailey. In fact, Lizard Dowlin, uh, just near Longford town, owned by the Redditon family, has two Baileys, which is again a, a, a relatively unique feature rather than just one. But anyway, this is a fantastic Mott and Bailey here at Granard, and the people of Granard are dead right to have opened an interpretive centre um, at the base of the hill down there uh, in, a couple of years ago entitled uh, Knights and Conquests. And I believe they're also opening up an Anglo-Norman kind of rural borough village theme park uh, beside it. So I would suggest people go and visit it. Uh, that would be a good thing. As I said, 
our feeling would be it was there is a historical reference to the castle being built here in 1199 by Richard de Chute. We know that it, Granard had a royal visit in 1210. Um, I would suggest to you that King John either camped or stayed in this very fine, camped outside or stayed in this very fine Motten Bailey. King John, I think I mentioned this the other day, King John being the villain in the Robin Hood films, um, I don't think he was as bad as he was made out to be, but he stayed here for a number of days in August 1210. Um, and we hear of the Mott and Bailey Castle here being taken into royal hands when Richard de Chute dies in 1211, and it's handed back to Richard's Lord, Walter de Lacey, in 1215. Granard gets burned in 1272, and again in 1315, just reminding you of the turbulence uh, in the area. But if you remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned something about farming and the fact that there was a landed estate, agricultural estate attached on to this castle. But there was more to it than that because very often Anglo-Norman lords like the Dechutes also founded villages and boroughs beside their mott castles. And the people who lived in these settlements rented land from the lord of the castle, in this case the Chute, and paid him rent and possibly carried out labour services for them on the land that they farmed directly, which is known as the mainland. So we, we know here from the historical records that there was a borough somewhere in the vicinity of the Mott Castle. Now, for various reasons, it was suggested that that particular borough existed at Granard Kill to our west, about a kilometre, less than a kilometre to our west, because there are the remains of deserted village earthworks there. Well, we carried out excavations there in 2002, 2004, and really the earthworks appear to be late 16th, 17th century in date. There was no indication of um, a borough settlement there, an Anglo-Norman nucleated settlement. Village, in other words, a village, but with uh, the status of a town. Furthermore, we wondered too, if the village, the original borough, if you like, of Granard lay to the west of the Mott between, between here and Granard Kill. And the heritage officer, um, uh, Longford heritage officer got gained funding and we carried out geophysical survey and no sign of the borough. Now that is disappointing to some people, but and it is disappointing. Negative evidence is important too. And so it's telling us that that borough did not lie to the west either at Granard Kill or between here, the Mott and Granard Kill. And it would seem to me the simplest answer is the best, and that is it's underneath the, the, the original town, if you like, borough founded by Richard de Chute is actually underneath the present town of Granard. And that makes all the sense in the world uh, because that is the area around here that is protected from prevailing winds and uh, weather and things like that. So what we would have expected then is a street running, if you like, um, eastwards or so, or east northeastwards from the Mott, from the base of the Mott, with timber buildings and burgage plots on either side. In terms of the people who live there, who were they, these Burgesses? Now, the, the, it would seem to me that the majority of them would have been of English origin, and they would have been different, if you like, in ethnicity to the majority Irish population uh, in the area. Okay, we, 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 that's pretty clear. Okay, so we have a Mott. We, we've, talked about, we've talked about the Mott and Bailey. Um, we've talked about the borough. The, as I said the other day, the Anglo-Normans, so, Anglo-Norman colony in uh, Longford becomes, comes under pressure from the late 13th century onwards and in the early 14th century appears to collapse. 
Well, what happens to their castles? What happens to the mott here at Granard? And it would seem to me, uh, and the same happens at Liz Ardallan as well, the O'Farrells take over, the, the Gaelic Irish O'Farrells take over the castle. And at some stage in the 15th, 16th century, it seems to me that a tower house was built on the uh, southeastern side of the Mott Slope. And this is not a stone behind me either. And this may be um, linked to that late medieval phase. So what we, it, it, it's mortared masonry. So what we seem to have here then is a timber Mott and Bailey castle built by the Anglo-Normans. And then maybe in maybe the late 14th century, 15th, 16th century, but I would think late 14th or 15th century, the O'Farrells build a masonry tower house into the side of the Mott. And we have a late 16th century map of Granard, a very late, early, sorry, when I say early, but a late 16th century map of Granard showing a masonry tower in that position. So what happens to the Burgesses? You know, again, we would presume the English, uh, ordinary English people who lived at the base of the Mott in the 13th century in that borough. Well, it's likely from what we can see that they uh, moved back into uh, modern day Meath, West Meath, maybe re-emigrated back to England. That would be the, the main theory. But there are little hints from the late 16th century that there are still English place names in the vicinity of Granard. And that sort of surprised me at the end of the day, that there were still English place names, despite the O'Farrells, the Gaelic Irish, Irish speaking O'Farrells, um, basically taking over the place in the early, early to mid 14th century or so. And it may well be that some of them decided, well, a lord's a lord, whether they're Gaelic Irish or Anglo-Norman, I'll just pay rent to the new Irish lord. I'll change maybe my, my language. I mean, I, I, at this stage, I'm sure a lot of those Burgesses would have been bilingual, intermarry with Irish people, but still keep the memory of those English place names um, a, a, alive to be recorded on early maps during the Tudor and Stuart uh, conquest. So I'm, 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 I'd like to think that at least some of the bur bur Burgesses in the borough remained in place, if you like, uh, in the later 14th, 15th, 16th century, intermarrying with local Irish and virtually becoming indistinguishable from them. And that some of their blood is still flowing in the veins of local people uh, here. But who knows, I mean, you know, there may be ways of finding out through DNA. I'm not I'm DNA testing, but let's not get into that. Okay, what else? I mean, some, and I'll finish up now. Yeah, okay. Um, what, what else can we say about the Mott? Because it, it still dominates the town to this day, uh, although it is a little bit blocked by tree, trees and the um, very fine Roman Catholic Church. Again, you know, monuments like this still still uh, create an impression on uh, the locality. For example, we know in 1798 that the Mott was a central feature or a central part of the Battle of Granard during uh, 1798. A lot of very heavy fighting went on around it. We have some folklore evidence that there may be a mass grave of rebel dead somewhere within the Bailey. And also the gibbet, um, the, the gallows that was used to hang some of the rebels um, lay at the base of the mott overlooking uh, the town. So that mott was to play a very significant part in the 1798 Battle of Granard. And when we were here in 2002, 2004, a very old lady said that during the sacking of Granard by the Black and Tans in 1920, uh, the townsfolk came up to the Mott and watched the destruction being wrought by Crown forces on the, on the town. And she said, I thought it was raining, but it was her mother's tears 
uh, actually dropping on her face. So that was pretty powerful to hear that. So, you know, the, the Mott has played an extraordinary part uh, in Granard's uh, history. We have a statue of St. Patrick on top as well, which I presume, um, I'm not quite sure when that statue was put up, maybe during the Eucharistic uh, Congress of 1932. Um, and, you know, that would be nice if that was actually restored and, and made to look a, a little bit better than it is because it's suffering from weather damage. Uh, but it looks over the town. So, that, that, you know, the, the Mott continues to have an effect upon the local uh, landscape. And long may it be so.